Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session. Um, so really excited for this session today. We are being joined by our chief market strategist, Rick Vinsignor. Um, if you're new to options play or if you've been here before, what we're really looking to do today is show you how our process is derived. Um, Rick has a very different process. There's a lot that I've personally learned from him and a lot that we all can certainly learn from him. So you might have gotten some of our, our daily trade ideas or some of our macro research and we'll give you all the tools and resources that are available to you. And in addition to show you some of this other sessions that you can attend to understand this contrarian approach, if you will, but how it's applied because it's not necessarily as black and white as it may seem. So I'd love to introduce Rick. If I'm sure you've met him before or heard his very famous name, um, but Rick, thank you so much for joining us today. Just thanks for having me. I'm not sure why just moments ago my camera's working and now it, it's telling me it's on, but I don't see myself. So I'm assuming you're not seeing me either, even though it's telling me it's on. But anyway. I, I, all good. I, I don't see it, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why, but uh, that's a, a goofy thing that seemed to have happened only from when we actually started the video recording. Nonetheless, I am here and uh, a pleasure to join you. Thank you. Yeah, and I think Rick and I were, were discussing prior to opening up this session, um, you know, kind of how it's very interesting time that we're in. I personally started in the stock market back in 2009. And so if you join a lot of my sessions, I'll, I'll tend to give quite a bit of history lessons, especially when we do the market playbook. Um, but I've been working in a bull market in my entire career, less of course recently. So that's where I've really learned the value of the contrarian approach and some of the indicators and models that Rick uses that can certainly complement your process, but gives you an edge and really takes you a step above it. So we're, we'll dive deeper into that. We are going to have some time with for some Q&A at the end. So feel free to put them in throughout, but just know that we'll answer those at the end. So with further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. And of course, before we get started, I'll, I'll give you a quick disclaimer. Just know that we'll use some securities. We'll use some, some real ones. Um, we'll show you some research tools as purely as for educational and informational tax, or excuse me, informational purposes only. Nothing is a recommendation or a solicitation from options play. We're not tax advisors or financial advisors. So just a little disclaimer that we always give you before we get started. And as far as what we're going to cover today, so a quick reminder, our members do have access to the Monday Macro Market Outlook. So Rick puts out a outlook every Monday. You can join that live session or give you a view. And it's a really great way to, to start your week and understand the direction that the markets are heading in and what you need to pay attention to, in addition to the research that comes out. But it's really what fuels those daily plays that you receive and a lot of the other aspects around options play. So it's important to understand the investment thesis how that process is. So we'll talk about that, make sure you get some clarification around that. And it can certainly help you with your process. Or like I said, if you're new, give you some insight into the way that, that our, our firm works. And then we'll talk about why counter trend and the edge that it certainly has, what's available to you and, and why it's important and how it maximizes your risk versus reward. We'll go through the actual indicators that that Rick uses. So I'll hand it over to him and make sure that he covers and gives us some good examples. Perhaps we'll even talk about, about the market and what we're looking at. Um, it's going through the DeMarc studies and the cloud model. And then we'll show you some options, play research and tools and save some time for Q&A. So Rick, with that, um, I know we, we've we talked about this briefly and you have got over 40 years of experience. You've been a, a floor trader before and, and how you really got that edge. So if you just want to give us a a good introduction into your investment thesis and, and why you have that approach, if you will. Sure. Um, so as Jess said, I, I started my career trading on the floor of the commodities exchange almost uh, directly out of college. One, one year later, I was already on the floor. Um, and I learned a heck of a lot about trading by being on the floor. And not just the process of trading, but kind of what separated winners from losers? Why is it that some floor traders made a fortune and some did okay and some struggled and some lost and those who lost didn't stick around long because generally the money flows very quickly in and out. And if you're consistently losing, unless you have uh, a rich uncle who's funding you continuously, you're gonna walk away and do something else with your life. 
And when I was trading in the pit, um, the, the stock index futures pit for as many years as I did, just by chance, the guy who I stood next to could rack it up day after day, just print money. And I, I so often just tried to study what is it he was doing that set him apart. And clearly there was something in his process that allowed him to consistently buy the bid and sell the offer before the market moved to just, uh, you know, literally printing money day after day. Part of it was his um, commitment to not ever going home with a losing day, which is incredible as a floor trader not to have a losing day. And when sometimes you'd start the day off and right away you'd be down money. One of your first couple of trades could be wrong. And, you know, the market can often quickly move from where it opens and he could be down a chunk and somehow he would just fight back all day saying, I cannot go home a loser. So part of it was just his raw determination to fight back and never quit. But the other thing was part of the process. So right away, I learned in my trading that process means a heck of a lot. Then when I eventually left the floor a dozen years later and then ended up at Morgan Stanley uh, in the, on the commodity side, that was actually a strategist for them in the mid to late 1990s, uh, I, for the first time in my life, was then starting to publish research uh, as a sell side strategist for clients of the firm. And I realized fairly quickly that in order to differentiate my work from all the other strategists out there, you had to do something differently. So if you just played along and kind of followed the same models that everybody else was using, you'd pretty much come up with very similar calls when others did. And you couldn't differentiate yourself, so you weren't going to stand out. And to me, like, why take a job like this and have all the stress and, um, you know, all the, the, the parts of the job if you weren't going to really be well known for what you do? So I, it was very important to me to, to come up with a process that would make myself stand out from other people. And I started looking into the models that existed on the street, things that I could get my hands on that were kind of out of the ordinary. And one of them happened to be matched up with a whole bunch of, um, you know, these were early days of programming and I'm not a programmer per, per se, but I was already looking at ways of kind of thinking about the market in a different way than most. And that, that led me towards if, if the process that we're all supposed to do is buy low and sell high, why is it so frequently that people can't do that correctly? And most of the research out there, I realized, could get you to buy and see the market go up. And by the time they got you to sell, you'd already give up 15, 20% off the high before people were convinced that it was time to sell. And generally, it took you 15 to 20% off the low before you decided the low was in place which leaves you kind of with the 60 to 70% left uh, if you miss the extremes of the move. And if you knew anything about statistics, 68% is what's considered the first standard deviation. So if you have a bell-shaped curve, the fat part of the curve represents 68% of the entire bell-shaped curve. And it occurred to me that if I was putting out recommendations and trading in the first standard deviation, the fat part of the bell curve, it'd be very difficult to outperform. You'd buy low and sell high, but you'd also end up buying high and selling low. And playing in that, that kind of median part of the marketplace, statistically and mathematically, is very hard. You can make money, Jess, but you can't, it's, it's very improbable that you could actually outperform. And the only way that you can consistently outperform is to buy low near real low points of a market decline and then sell near the highs before a new decline would come in. Easier said than done, clearly. Most people, as hard as they try to do it, can't do it. But I started really putting time and effort into studying and looking at models that in their, in their essence tried to do that. 
And that's how I came out and realized that counter trend trading, as difficult as it is, is actually a better way to trade than the way most people trade, which is they buy kind of because they think a low is in place or we've just broken out from, let's say, some resistance and you're buying the breakout. Um, and you can make money that way for sure, but it's really hard to manage risk. And as we go through more of our discussion and we look at some examples, we'll talk about and I'll show you how and why it's so hard to manage risk when you buy deep into an uptrend or sell well into a downtrend. You're playing along with the trend the way most people will tell you, but it's very hard to actually manage your risk on a trade like that. So, uh, you know, after doing this for years and years and realizing that there was an edge to going counter trend, and also through my talking with some of the most prominent hedge funds in the world, uh, which I still do, you realize that the most successful hedge fund managers generally are counter trend people. They're not trend followers. So that's kind of how, you know, I got the whole inkling and the reason behind why I started looking counter trend and realizing that doing what other people aren't doing at the right time and place. And that's the, that, that second half of that sentence, Jess, is the critical thing here. I don't just go, if 90% if of people are bullish, I'm not going to be bearish just because 90% of the people are bullish. But if I can find a place that the market will most likely not continue and 90% of the people are bullish, then I can position myself bearishly and be ahead of the turn before it's obvious that a turn's taking place. So I don't want to, I don't want, if a stock peaked at 100, I don't want to first decide to sell at 80 and watch it go down. And look, if it goes from 80 to 60, you're glad you sold at 80. But again, you're probably not outperforming your benchmark if you do that. But if you actually sold out at like 95 and then it sold down, now you've, hopefully sold high. And when you figure out where to come back in and buy low, that's how you create alpha and you actually outperform. So yeah. that's kind of how and why I came up with this as the reasoning behind what I do and why the trades that we put on um, go against the grain. And generally, um, even in the daily play, we'll say, you know, here's a buy order in a in a short term and medium term bearish market. It's because I've determined from as best I can that we've actually likely exhausted the downtrend before it's obvious to anyone that it's that it's exhausted. And the smart money in this industry is positioned correctly for the next move. It's not about the current move. It's being ahead of the game and positioning yourself at the right time and place to have the edge over all the people who are still thinking that an uptrend is an uptrend um, when it's actually already given indications that it's not going to be, but it hasn't broken trend lines, moving average or anything yet that would say, oh, that trend is over. By the time it does, again, you're usually a good double digit percentage wise off the high or the bottom before it's obvious that the trend has changed. Yeah, so definitely a lot of value in that. And there is a couple of things that I want to point out that you stated. Um, first is just the length of time that you've been doing this in the industry, but how you've, you've really gone through various processes before you landed on this model. So I think that's helpful. And for our members and viewers to understand is this is um, really gone through a process, if you will, to find something that's really valuable. And you know, it's you are certainly right. It it might be a little simple to spot those support and resistance zones, but when they're exhausted or about to turn, sometimes they are a little late. So utilizing this this method, it's it's um certainly it it it, it's, it's very valuable and that's why we utilize it. And in the daily play and in the daily plays, we do say when it is a counter trend, um, if it is against the grain, so you can get that methodology around it and, and populate it within the tool and such. So that's, that's really great. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, 
So moving on, we just wanted to talk about the, the risks and reward for utilizing a counter trend, which we, we've touched on and, and Rick really touched on there. It's just, if we can talk about the processes of, of how you've outperformed the S&P, if you will, and how that translates um, just really high level. And we've got a little visualization of spotting a counter trend, but we'll hand it over to Rick to, to go over the actual process and he can give us an indication into that. And we'll we'll talk a little more about how those studies really work. Um, but do you mind just talking about the, the risk versus reward for one moment, Rick? Sure. So one of the most critical decisions that any trader or investor can make is determining the risk reward, or better said, the reward versus the risk that you're going to take to potentially make that reward on any trade or investment idea. Uh, it's critical information to know before you commit dollars to the trade. And in general, you want to have at least a two to one or three to one potential reward relative to the risk you're willing to take. Um, on very occasional times, I might line up and do something where I think the risk and reward are fairly similar. But because I have enough confidence that the trade's going to work, I might put it on. But generally, I know before I get into a trade, where's my stop out level? So how much I'm willing to risk on the trade, on my idea of being correct. And I generally have a pretty good idea of where I'm going to get out of that trade from before I've even committed money. And again, most people in the most people don't do that. Certainly. Most individual investors don't do that. They always seem to be concerned about how much they can make versus how much they can lose. And I'm going to tell you that how much you can lose is the much more important piece of that equation versus how much you can make. So I when, when I go and I approach something, especially when I'm going counter trend, it's essential for me to know at what point, if I'm going to stand in front of a falling knife, but I think the knife is done falling, I still need to protect myself if I'm wrong, if that knife still falls. So I need to know at what point, if I'm going counter trend, do I need to get out because my, my belief that I've been able to spot a bottom is, is just simply not correct, right? So it's managing the risk on the trade. I also need to look at how much I think that if I'm going to buy a falling knife, how much upside is potentially in the cards for the risk I'm willing to take. And again, I want to see these line up to be two or three to one in order for me to take it. And I have walked away from many a trade over my career um, that would have made money. But to me, I had to risk too much. If I'm going to buy a $30 stock and I don't see strong support until let's say $24, even though I think it's going to stop near 30, I'm not going to risk that $6 over 30, that's 20%. I'm not going to risk 20% of my money or client's money. Um, you know, I, I speak to, uh, besides doing work for options play, I have my own consulting businesses where I, I consult to institutional clients and I consult to individual clients through my, in the no trader platform. So if I'm going to constantly be putting out recommendations to um, either the general public or a more specific institutional public, I'm going to walk away from trades that simply seem like one needs to take too much risk in order to potentially make the reward. And again, I've walked away from lots of trades that would have made money, but from a risk reward point of view, they didn't make sense. So when I look to do things, the first thing I'm looking at is how much do I risk? If I'm going to stand in front of a runaway train, how much am I willing to think um, that, or how much risk am I willing to take that my idea is right, that this is where it's going to stop? And for those of you who have been around the street for quite some time, in whatever capacity, you have heard throughout your career that you cannot time the markets. And every major firm on the street will tell you, you cannot time the markets. And of course, part of them telling you that is 
a marketing effort to use them for long-term investing because they're going to tell you, you know, we can make you money over time. Well, first of all, you can make yourself money over time with or without having a money manager that you pay for. And secondly, I have disproved the fact that you cannot time the market because it's what I've been doing successfully for virtually the 40 years that I've been on Wall Street. Now, it took me some time at the beginning in order to be able to figure out how to do this. But fair to say for 25 or 30 years, I've done it. Um, I continually outperform the S&P. In fact, one of the pieces I do for In the No Trader um, is specifically designed to beat the S&P. It's called the 7-Eleven Report. And in the two years that we've put out this monthly report, we've outperformed the S&P by 716 basis points, 7.16%, simply being in spider macro ETFs that the, the, the um, XLK, XLU, XLI, you know, all the, the 11 sectors being no more than seven at a time with the goal of staying away from the underperformers. And we have beaten the S&P now for two years straight, um, chipping away almost 30 bips a month and, and just um, beating performance over time. And I do it through the same models I'm going to show you today. So much value there. Um, and then just real quick on identifying trend exhaustion, utilizing those institutional timing models and how it's happening. Um, we talked about DMARCs. Maybe this is the part where we'll, we'll hand it over to you, Rick, where you can share your screen and, and show us what we're looking at and how DMARC studies work. And last time we did this session, we didn't touch too much on the cloud model and we utilized that as well. And I, I think that's something that's super beneficial as well in, in spotting those trend reversals. And that is how you can beat the market. And I do think it's a wonderful thing that you say, because that is something that I um, say I grew up in finance, even saying you can't time the market because it, from a regulation perspective and from a marketing perspective, there are things that you are required to say and the, that you market, and that is certainly one of them. So I can definitely attest to that. Um, and you've definitely proven that you can, and you can be a successful self-directed trader, but it does take a disciplined approach. And I think it's regardless if you utilize this or not, your, your um, discussion on risk versus reward is applicable no matter what type of investing you're doing. Utilizing this model, purely options or something else, risk versus reward is something that's extremely important and and detrimental to success, if you will. So if you'd like, Rick, I'd, I'd love for you to share your screen and, and show us what DMARC looks like. Um, I know we've had some offline discussions about how some how how the the model's proprietary, how it was even invented before we've all had access to these technical analysis platforms, but it's not available in technical analysis platforms. Um, so that there's some value there that we can offer you as an options claim member is, is utilizing that method to give you research, to give you understanding. So you get that right in your inbox every Monday. And then of course, um, a discussion, live discussion with Rick as well. Yeah, so let me suggest, let me see if I can grab the screen. And sure. Let's see. Okay. Can you Perfect. see that? Yes. Okay. All right. So here's, um, let me, let me drag this over here and actually I'll just drag this off and let's take a look at, uh, do, do, do. let's do, I'm going to try this. Yeah. I'm going to start with a weekly, actually, let's take, let's give a, a clean chart. So here's, here's Microsoft on a weekly chart going back, I don't know, about four years or so. So we see the very strong up move, the bullish market that had here, here on kind of in the middle of the screen uh, where my cursor is, this is the COVID sell-off in early 2020 and the recovery since. Uh, and it's actually phenomenal when you realize, you know, if you take the average price, uh, just before COVID, right? So you got up to 170, 180, and look at what the all-time high is. I mean, this this thing almost doubled itself, um, mm -hmm. and and off of the COVID low, it more than doubled itself, uh, which it's it's pretty incredible. So you you look at this long-term uptrend, and what makes you know? Okay, so it topped where it did, but you may not know it's going to be a top where it did. And maybe sometime here in early January, you start getting the sense that, all right, well, at least we took out those December or the fourth quarter lows, but 
how do we know, okay, so there are other lows to deal with. At what point do we start looking at a chart like this and think about that perhaps the game is changing? And, and a standard technical analyst um, is probably, let's say they might take a trend line from the COVID low, draw it something like, I don't know, something like that and say, okay, in, you know, here in the fourth week of January, early February, this broke down, maybe I should be selling some, some shares. And if you did, you've actually done pretty well from the time since because you're, you're first getting back now to where we were when this broke down. So you at least avoided this part, but then you also had to know that it was time to come back in because if you, if you sold the shares and it's right back to where you sold them, all you could do at this point is replace them at where you sold them for. Uh, you didn't make any money by doing that. But that's, let's say, one thing some people might do. Let's take a look, maybe a MACD. Uh, chart. Well, this was actually helpful here, uh, kind of mm -hmm. into the beginning of the year. You got a sell signal, but you've had some other sell signals before. But this is the one that saw really a consistent uh, spread between the two lines that make up the MACD indicator, and they never crossed until recently. So that actually was pretty helpful. But you certainly could have gotten knocked out way before that in 2020 and maybe never even gotten back in. Who knows? Um, but it's certainly something I look at MACD as, as um, almost any chart I put up, I look at the MACD. It's never going to be the main reason I do something, but I like to kind of see um, where it is. But, and, and I'm trying to think what else maybe Bollinger Bands, I'm, I'm trying to think what like the average person would look at. And this really wouldn't be too helpful um, because if you, if you understand the calculations of Bollinger Bands, 95% of all price action is going to be within the bands. So you, you can't say if, if we rally up to the top on your band, you're a seller. Um, because if you sold it out here in 2021, you, you, know, you missed all this move. I mean, you could have been a seller against the top band forever. Um, so yeah, I've always used that one as strength of trend. If it's hugging it, then it's strength. Otherwise not a self signal but I think okay. right yeah, but that's, so that's, here that's even helpful. right there are times we pull back and we hold the middle the middle bollinger band it comes back but yeah you know you never quite know um in fact one of the best things you can do is if you're convinced you have a bull market is forget about the overbought bollinger you know playing against the top band just worry about playing against the bottom band because if you can buy in a bull market the lower bollinger band that's almost a very good entry point if you're convinced you still have a bull market. Um, so whether it's this, whether I put up an RSI chart that gets overbought, if every time it got overbought, you kicked it out, again, you never had a chance except for, look, one time in 2020, you got oversold enough to come back in. Um, you wouldn't have really had, you never hit real oversold. So you might've sold it a million times on the way up, but never gotten back in. This, this is mm -hmm. some of the problems with, standard technical analysis so agree with that let me clean up the chart and tell you how i would look at this so the first thing i would do is put up you were talking about jamark model so let me just tell you a little bit about who this guy is or if you've never heard of him gentleman's name is tom jamark in the 1970s he created a whole slew of models that um, he created himself he only made available to institutional clients. And in the 1970s, he was probably the single most famous and um, respected market timer out there. There were plenty of technicians out there, but they couldn't do what he did because his models looked at the markets in a very different way than any standard technical analysis does. Uh, Part of it is that he created models that time the market. So it's not about horizontal levels that break out. It's not about a moving average or something that bounces, uh, that price bounces from it. it literally, uh, there's a certain pattern that he saw in the market that has to do with timing. And he called the model sequential. And you can read up on, you know, you can Google Tom DeMarc sequential and get the basics. And I'll, I'll give you a few of the things here uh, about the model. Um, there's a sister model called Combo, which is very similar. 
it just counts to where it needs to count differently. And mm -hmm. the key numbers in this model are both nines and 13s. So um, what's a nine count? In the case, if, if uh, the software is printing numbers above price bars, it means you're moving higher. And that each one of these bars, I'm going to blow this up a bit so that everybody can see it nice and easy. So in this string here from, this was May of last year, um, 2021, this bar was labeled number one. Why? Because its close was higher than the close from four bars prior. What's number two? Its close was above the close from four bars prior. And when you do nine bars in a row, whatever time frame you're looking at, most especially daily, weekly, monthly, but people use this for day trading also, when you have a string of nine consecutive bars in a row that the close is greater than the close from four bars back, or in this case here, from January, starting January this year, this close, the first week of January, was less than the close from four back, and so on. And even though, let's see, um, so look at bar four here. Bar four had a close that was above bar three, but it's still called bar four going down. Why? Because even though it was up on the week, the close was less than the close four bars back. When you do nine in a row, you often, you according to DeMarc's thinking, you've moved enough in one direction to potentially have a bigger trend. And there are rules to find the exhaustion point to the trend. And in, a, in his standard sequential model, you would look for subsequent closes, if, if a market was moving up, that the close is above the high two weeks back. And that would get a count. And when you got 13 times that the close was above the high two weeks back, you'd often find the exhaustion point to a trend. He then created a sister model to it which changed how he counted, but still looks to get to the 13th bar as likely being exhaustion to a trend. And so in my analysis of the markets, I look at the different ways that we may be exhausting a trend as part of how I look to fade moves. It's not the only way, but it's, it's one of the important ways that I look. Um, and in this case, for instance, in the case of Microsoft, it is, for instance, suggesting in, that's where, early October or so? No, early November, exhaustion of trend. Once it shows this signal, it also puts out a horizontal um, dashed or dotted line of where, if properly broken above, it would suggest that this signal was not going to work. So in this case, Early November, it's telling us exhaustion of trend. A couple of weeks later, we make higher highs, but we don't take out the stop out level or what they would call the risk level. Um, and then it starts selling off. We get a nine count down. Often we see nine counts actually. So I said that you've, uh, according to DeMarc, you've got to move at least nine uh, to a nine count to even say that you potentially even have a trend. A lot of times nine counts are all, all the market moves and it goes the other way. Uh, so in this case, you kind of got a month long bounce off of the nine count um, at the bottom of this year, one, one week below before the lowest low of 2022. We have also a nine count signal knowing that this could be all it goes. Now, that's just simply looking at one DeMarc model. I also add to, and this is also something that um, he realized a long time ago that in many times on a chart is not going to come from an obvious point. But if you do a nine count, ooh, what just happened here? Your system has run over, oh, that's not good. Oh, we can't see that. We can see your screen, it's okay. Oh, good, okay. No, I just had some <laughs> pop-up telling me your system's out of memory. Uh, oh. <laughs> Let's see, do I have, what am I running here? There's not, I don't have much open at all. That shouldn't be. Nonetheless, here we go. Once you do a nine count up, we put on a, another indicator related to this model called a TDST line, the trend setup. 
In other words, where did the, if, if a nine count suggests that there could be a trend here that goes beyond the nine count, that trend started at the lowest low in the nine count. That's this horizontal line here. Wow, this, this pop-up box keeps showing up. I, we don't see it. You don't see it. Okay, let me close a couple of other things that are running just to, I didn't think I had much at all here, but I'm gonna just close down anything that seems like it would be a memory hog. Okay, <coughs> sorry. So um, one more I'm going to close. I've read Google Chrome is a memory hog. I like Shani's comment, Microsoft playing tricks on a Mac. That was uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's something that's very cool within Mark's, uh, Mark's models too. If a nine count represents a potential trend, then the lowest low in the nine count is where that trend started. But if you look at this chart, no technician would ever pick this level of, uh, where are we here? Let's say 249.81 as being a support level. If anything, I you would put that. the low here, lows here, right? There's no uh -huh. way you would pick this as a support level. So mm -hmm. look what happened when we sell down to that second nine count, look where this is showing support in a hidden it's place that nobody flawless. who doesn't yeah. know this model would ever pick. And that's part of how, when I look at this stuff, I can figure out where to go counter trend when it's not obvious to other people. If I took these models off, so I take off combo and I take off this TDST line, you, you really would not, and I can tell you from somebody who's doing this over 40 years, you would have not have picked this kind of 250 level as the place you would have picked. Maybe you would have looked at some prior highs here. Mm -hmm. Maybe, but this, I mean, this is not much of a high, whereas this lasted for months. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you would have picked here, maybe, but I'm, I'm just saying it's not an obvious place. <laughs> so it's more of how I can go counter trend. Now, we've looked at sense. combo. We looked at TDST line. So let me put it back. Uh, TDST line, combo. Now I put up cloud charts. What does the cloud chart tell me? Well, I see in May for the first time in probably quite some years, potentially, price is broken beneath the cloud itself. The cloud is this shaded zone. Now this is has nothing to do with Tom DeMarc. This is a model that was created in the 1940s. Um, in Japan and not made public until the 1960s. This model suggests, based upon this blue line bouncing on its cloud, that there is important support here. So now I have three different indicators, one a timing model, one a hidden support level, and one understanding cloud charts. Um, dare I say that in the Western world, I am considered the foremost expert on cloud charts. I mostly introduced it to the Western world. I've taught more institutional clients how to use these than uh, any other single individual. And I've been doing these for now uh, since 1997. Uh, so that's uh, 24 years or something like that, right? 24, 25 years. Um, that I have That's been using say. this in my analysis on a consistent basis. Cloud charts are a core model to how I look at markets too. So when I put these together, this is kind of a basic chart, Jess, that I, this is how I would look at a chart for starters before I do anything else in looking at a market. I've got some DeMarc timing models. I've got TDST lines. I actually often put up a model called propulsion which helps me create targets in opposite directions um, for how much uh, something may move. And I put those all together and come up with ways of playing counter trend. Now, let's play this idea that somewhere in here, we start to nibble on the idea of going long in the face mm -hmm. of what virtually most people would look at as a down market. 
how do I know when I'm wrong? Well, I'm not going to give you all my tricks of the trade from 40 years worth of doing this. But what I can tell you is identify, I, I kind of choose an area that says this attempt at stabbing a bottom is not likely going to work. And that is almost always far closer to where a current price is than what I'm going to make on the trade if I'm right. So if I go counter trend, and let's say in this case, let, let's just say if I went long near 250 and risked, I'll just pick a number, 240, 230, something in here that gives me $15, $20 downside versus the potential that I could have seen at the time to get as high as where we are right now, which is the bottom of the cloud. So that's, where is that, 287 versus 250, right? So that's 37 versus risking 15 to 20, virtually double. That's a trade I'll take. Got it. If I'm wrong, I lose. And this allows me to lose several times, right? I can lose two times for every time I make. So the key to all this is proper money management. If you buy, if you had bought in here and you just let this go, let's say the bear market continued and it just falls and falls, how do you manage risk on that trade? You, you end up like a deer in headlight. You're just staring at something that's falling down. And at what point, when you look, let me, let me kind of bring back history here. Where does this have to trade? If I take all this stuff off and I take the line away and I take the TDST line away. And let's just say you happen to have bought that for whatever reason in your analysis you did. How far down would Microsoft have to go before you say to yourself, uh-oh, this is not good. I don't want to be owning this name. It's the same problem. Let's say I show you this chart. Mm -hmm. And you, I don't know, somewhere here, let's say, we even look at this. We look at a little triangle pattern that developed over a short amount of time. And this, so we have a flag that, or pennant that breaks out to the upside. So you buy strength. Let's say you pay 240 and the stock's moving up, it's great. That's wonderful. What happens if you did the same thing, except you bought this breakout here? And you'd say, oh, perfect. Now, how do you manage risk on that trade? Now, let's say a couple months later, it's down and it's real time that week and you're underneath the lows, the last low that it made before you bought the breakout. How do you decide how much you can risk? Where are you wrong or where are you willing to walk away from on a trade like that? Buying deep in an uptrend, you can make money. If you bought this one, you made money. You bought this one, you didn't. How do you manage risk? Where is the point at which you're wrong for having bought? I think a and lot of people is, plot plot their <laughs> support zones or have a percentage, but I think it's utilizing those DMARC studies that really give you the edge to find the proper support zone. It's very hard when you play deep in a trend. I mean, yeah. you could have been a buyer for years and done great, but there's mm -hmm. a point where you also you just you you also you just don't know. If you had bought just before COVID hit, and you saw the stock go from where is that 190 to 135 or so? So you lost a third of your value. I mean, heck, yeah, it, it ultimately held, you know, against some of these lows here. But how do you manage risk when you're losing 30% on a trade? I don't want to lose 30% of my money, hoping I'm right. I need to have enough to be more confident about what I'm doing. And that stuff is working. Great. And a lot of the standard technical analysis fakes you out. Uh, look at a daily chart. What do we all see? Oops. What do we all see here um, in the U.S. 10-year? This is TNX. Head and shoulders top. Mm -hmm. It broke down, right? So you're all selling the yield chart, which means you're buying bonds. What did we do last week, Jess? What trade did we put on in TLT? Did the opposite. <laughs> we went the opposite way because mm -hmm. I had already been calling 
that this would not be a breakdown if you didn't get Friday closes beneath 2.58%. Where did I get that from? The weekly chart with a cloud chart on it. I knew where this line was. Basically. Uh -huh. Notice here, one weekly close beneath, holds, breaks out, pulls back, holds the yellow uh, orange line, up new, holds the orange line. So while other people used this head and shoulders level last week and got out of things, mm -hmm. we went the other way and we, what we do, we bought a TLT put because we were playing for bond prices to come down, yields to go up. The fake out to the downside that, it, that came right back told me we're probably going to go up towards 2.9 to 3%. And that's why we put the trade on. So you know, there's that head and shoulders of, will fix so many people out. <laughs> of so course, valuable. of course. And on the daily chart, it's very obvious. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can't not see if you're if you're a trained technician, you cannot not see that there's some head and shoulders pattern here. And whether you wanted to use this as your neckline, the higher line, or the lower purple line, you know, I'll make it a different color just for. Right. If you wanted either one, you wanted to use, and the and the purple one is actually the the better one to have used because it really caught the inside of the shoulders, right, and the head. So twice we came down to this low two point sevens level. That's you know, you 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 would have sold out, and for a week you feel like a hero, and now what do you feel like? A bum, right? That's and yeah. that's what trade. That's the game of trading. So when I realized that chances are this fake breakout caught people the wrong way, then I played this the other way to go up. And that's just, again, years of experience of, of you know, kind of playing. Also, when we looked at the TLT chart itself, I knew from when we looked at uh, all the time that we had been and we had bought some stuff down here, by the way. Take a look. I think it was sequential. Uh, yep. So look at this down move that we can identify has exhausted itself in real time. Take a look where that occurred. That downside signal came right against the same level that had bottomed the market in 2018. So the last low made in bond prices before bond yields made all-time lows and bond prices made all-time highs was this level right here. Look where we get a 13 signal at, which came right after a nine. So I took the chance to buy this, saying the first target is 119.42 from like 112-ish. What's mm -hmm. 11942? It's the bullish propulsion level that we needed to properly hurdle in order to then say we're going to thrust higher to get up to near 131. We couldn't do it. So that false breakdown in the TNX is the same thing as this slightly moving upward here. As soon as it came back underneath is when we sold, uh, when we bought the, the, the TLT put. So we currently, in our you know, our options play daily play portfolio are long a 118 and a half, 114 and a half put spread. Look where we closed today, 114.38. We already hit the lower strike in a matter of a week since we put this on. We'll take half off tomorrow morning because anytime I put it on a spread, when I reach the, the other part of this, you know, we, we do things generally at the money. So if, if I'm buying a 118 and a half, 114 and a half put spread, if I get to 114 and a half, which is a level I, I choose for a reason, I'm going to take half off. And now we can play with the rest, having locked in a decent profit. And this was a quick profit. It took no time at all for us to get here. I mean, we just put this trade on a few days ago. So, um, and we'll see what happens now you know is is this going to potentially we go if we go back to now a daily chart of the same thing let's see has the uptrend line broken yet well yes it did so now we know that's you know anybody who bought against that's no good but i see we're on a daily 12 so 
I know if we trade down to probably around 113-ish, something near there, we're going to get another 13. And that's my chance to possibly take the rest off. I do have a negative MACD cross, which is good for being bearish, but we mm -hmm. made money on this trade. And, and you know, with options, you want to make money quickly. You want your ideas to work quickly. And this worked in a matter of several days. So this is all part of how I put on trades and, and why I can do um, what I do and kind of fade the moves. Here's um, another chart I was just going to show you, which is, you know, here's your chart, let's say, of Micron on a daily chart. And if you just look at how many different highs or lows are accompanied by nines or 13s, you get a sense of why the institutional community cares a heck of a lot about this model. Now, not everyone's going to work and you're not always going to know which ones to take and which ones aren't. But it's just, you know, look, let's go back to May a year ago. We happened to get a nine day pattern of an up move. It, now it's much more than nine days, but it took there's wow. this looks like about a 15 day up move. But it's only at this point did it actually create a nine day pattern in which that topped the move. And we pull back to, you know, this became range trading. Mm -hmm. And now this nine count didn't help, but it did tell us that if we extend beyond it, you're likely going to go and print to 13. And that's more likely an exhaustive point. And look where the exhaustion point is, somewhere between 95 and 97. And we mm -hmm. get there and then you sell off and you sell off to a nine down that comes all the way back up. And then you sell off again and do a nine down and a 13 down at the same time and go all the way back up and hit the propulsion exhaustion level and so on. And finally, this 13 didn't work. So after one, two, three 13s that worked, one didn't. And this is you know live through today. It's just one chart. I mean, th this there are people who trade s p futures on one minute charts using this model i haven't looked in ages at this but let me see oh i put the wrong ticker in. you can't it, it's very clear though when you show it this way how you could look at a chart and get a signal to sell or buy and you'd say that is very against this trend and look so look here here was a good this is a mind you this is a one minute chart of s p futures i'm not recommending you trade like this, but there are people who do this. Uh, you have a sell signal here. You might have covered here. And even if you went long, you got stopped out. But you made a heck of a lot more on your short than you lost being long. Next time we see something as a nine count here, it's gone sideways since. And it looks like the first bar tomorrow morning, we could easily print a 13. Doesn't mean I'm going to take it. And again, this is a one, a one minute chart. Um, I can switch this to a 30 minute chart. Look, look peak low at least for then mm -hmm. peak here's a peak here's sideways here's a little early you know again these aren't always going to work but it certainly gives you a sense that counter trading counter trend trading can be far more profitable in the right hands than simply using the traditional technical analysis most people use which almost always is lagging in its nature and there isn't a single model out there in the world of technical analysis that can get you to buy a low or sell a high in real time of that actual high or low, because almost all the indicators are lagging indicators. And by the time they tell you to sell, you're off the high or off the low. Yeah, I think that's really proves the value of it and also gives a little color on the, the risk reward and the daily plays and how maybe perhaps there is a loser in there but that's because sure. of the model and the, the winners are going to overcome that because it's all about portfolio management and risk versus reward so i think that was truly truly helpful um there are a lot of questions on how those can ask or excuse me access dmark studies um and it is something that is um very specific on where you have to access it and i think it's about 500 a month not it's, through options yeah, play. It's it's <laughs> it, yes. It's um, there's there are two professional platforms. Uh, one is Bloomberg, so you have to be a Bloomberg subscriber, and I don't mean Bloomberg Internet that you can sometimes get on a promotion for a buck ninety nine a month. That gives you access okay. to their web page, but to you, you actually have to be an institutional client of um, Bloomberg.
Bloomberg, which will run you $25,000 a year before putting DeMarc models into this. Again, this is meant to be institutionally accessed. Um, the second platform is the platform I have, which is called CQG. And this will run you anywhere from uh, probably in the neighborhoods of 700 a month to close to 2000 a month, depending upon um, what you have on it. But the DeMarc models will run you a minimum of 500 plus then you need to have you have no data there so you have to feed all the exchange feeds into it so you're you're going to be at least at seven to eight hundred dollars a month uh, especially if you want futures lastly um demark himself um has a, a company that started this as a um internet based product available for the public at a reduced price of about 200 a month but I will tell you, it is still in beta mode. Um, I don't recommend it because it crashes frequently. And um, even though they have programmed it, it often their signals actually don't align to their own coding on other platforms. So I know it's, uh, it's certainly better than nothing. You, again, have to be, you know, it depends on how much you want to spend a month. Um, I, I, I still not at the point that I recommend the DeMarc analytics model to people because of how wonky it is and how often it crashes and takes your whole system down. Um, but you could try it. I mean, you said, I think you get some free trial period or something. Um, I'm not sure, but it's, it's more reasonable cost than the ones I have, but to do what I do, I can't take the, you know, the chance of information not being accurate. I want to show you this um, just before we turn to questions. And this sure. is ARKK, right? This is Kathy Wood's flagship yeah. ETF, the ARK model. Now, this is a monthly chart. Mm -hmm. And I want to show you how and why, as options play, we, we were selling uh, put spreads down here and mm -hmm. how I got my in the no clients in here. Um, even well before we got there. So one of the things I do is take a look at the cloud chart on a monthly time frame. Mm -hmm. Now, we're you know this is this collapses, and but I know where the cloud is. One of the beauties of the cloud model is you actually know where it's going to be in the future. Twenty six bars of whatever time frame you're looking at. This is a monthly chart. So this takes me out over two years. I see what the cloud structure looks like and where it's going to be. On a weekly chart, it gives you 26 weeks. You actually get to see half a year ahead where potential support or resistance can be. And on a daily chart, you're going out 26 days. That's more than a month's worth of trading days. You know, the average month has 21, 22 trading days in a month. So you get to see more than a month ahead where support or resistance are. I knew when I saw this falling, I had a pretty darn good clue where I wanted to be a buyer. When I look at this on a weekly chart, we certainly broke the cloud a long time ago. So by looking at the weekly time frame, we knew that this had fallen apart and that it was mm -hmm. going to be gone, um, certainly under 90 for sure. But even, you know, we already had an early clue when it was still trading at 105 once we broke that things could be changing in this name. If I put up the TDST line, and I, so again, that TDST line would be the lowest low in a nine count up. This line here, I'm not even showing you the nine count. I'm just telling you there was a nine count right here. I mean, if I pull up sequential, you can see the nine count. So this line here at $40 and I think at 23 cents or here, 40.20 was a line that started this whole rally. So I know there's support there. So I know right around 40 bucks is where I want to buy. And I told my institutional clients, and we still own this now. We're long at 40 bucks and it's trading close to 50. Um, I go back to the, oh wait, I think even on this, let me see, this combo at the, yep. TD combo caught the bottom. The sister model to sequential caught the bottom. So now I have another reason that has nothing to do with this TDST line, which has nothing to do with this monthly cloud chart that 
that there's a weekly 13. And guess what? The same time the weekly 13 showed up, the setup nine count showed up. Nine months in a row that the close on the last day of the month was less than the close from four months prior. So I have multiple reasons, different time frames, all telling me 40 bucks or so is where I, you want to get into this. So in options play, we don't usually just take a directional play. So I didn't, we didn't just like buy calls. We kept selling downside puts because mm -hmm. first we bought 43s and sold 41s against them. Then we rolled them down to 41s versus 39s or 39s versus 37s. So we had a couple of winning trades here. Now we're not long for the big move up, but we simply pocketed the premiums that we took in saying that this wasn't going to go down anymore. Mm -hmm. My other clients, I happened to get them in starting at the top of the cloud. So we got in from in the no trader clients, we got in anywhere from 47 down to 39. And then all, so we have an average long at 43 that we still have. That's yeah. Cash secured puts correct though. So that's the way, you know, I do this and this is how and why I can pick stuff that people go, Rick, you're nuts. This is screaming to the upside. Why would you be a seller? And well, because I can often tell when something is going to exhaust itself before everybody else does. There's a monthly 13 here back in the middle of 2018. It took a year and a half before we exceeded that price. There's ways of using options. There's ways of using lots of strategies when so much even for in institutions, right? Who want to stay long, let's say ARC, but they'll trade around their core position. And that's why they come to me because trading prowess, trading skill is what I've had in being able to identify how and when to buy and sell that's not obvious to the average eye. And that's how, you know, we just consistently beat the game because we can sell at 90 and buy this back at 40 and be very comfortably positioned right now. And notice this is now the fourth month in a row that we've actually gone from cloud high to cloud low. The clouds range has been the month. I can't say that we've broken out yet. We could gotten, you know, we could stay in this for a while just kind of tight ranges, you know, five, six, seven dollar ranges for the month and stay in this. Be interesting to see if we see, you know, if we go sideways for a month, we're going to come out of that range. But right now, one, two, three, four months in a row since May, when we first got into this, this monthly cloud has contained price action. It's why I look at the models I do, folks, and why I give so much credence to the models I've shown you here. They very valuable stuff. A huge difference. Yeah. They certainly do. And so that's how we decide if it's bullish and bearish in a position and then where to choose the strike prices and um, credit versus debit, if you will. So a yeah. lot of processes. Um, and yeah. I did see a couple of questions as far as accessing the cloud. So that one is a little more accessible. It's normally found within your brokerage firm's active trader platform. And it's also available in the charting tool within options play as well. So that right. one. You can so access. we have it in options play. It's in Ameritrade, it's in TradingView, it's in stock charts. I mean, most trading platforms, Merrill Lynch's, wherever you have your brokerage account, um, as long as they have a decent charting platform, chances are they will have this. Now, you may have a little trouble finding it because hardly anyone actually calls it cloud charts because that's really the English translation of and what the mnemonic became. The name of this model, and I'm going to put it here on my chart, I'll just go into uh, like I'll add a text here. It's Ichimoku. Here, let me use capital letters. It won't be. I always spell that wrong too. I probably did when I say it. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, uh, here it is. And let me see if I can even make it nice and big. We'll make the, the font much bigger. There we go. Ichimoku. That's probably what you're going to see it labeled as on your charting system. I have yet to see one that calls it cloud charts. This is the Japanese name for this cloud, for this model. Yes. Okay. So, um, Jess, I think I'll turn it back to you. Hopefully you've gotten a pretty good sense of how and why we put on trades where we do. That may not be obvious to most.
most people, but give us what we think is a real edge with, with very controlled risk. Yeah, I and mean, thank you for sharing that. I think it's super helpful. And I know um, if, if we do have some some new members out there or people who haven't joined before, because we, we have had made this available um, to everyone is that's that's the beauty of having Rick as our chief market strategist. Like we've been saying daily plays quite a bit. That's where we give you a daily trade idea and we give you an entry point and we tell you literally the strikes and expirations, why, if it's a counter trend and, and things of that nature. In addition to that, Rick hosts a macro market outlook every single Monday at 845. We also have Q and A with that, and so there's a lot of useful information that's available. So, because I know D DMARC studies are very difficult to access, so we do our best to give you that um, access available to you. And then on top of that, we have Rick's perspective to help interpret it, because as you can tell, it's not just one indicator no. that defines a process; it's a process overall. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, we can turn it over. We've got maybe. Give it about five minutes for questions. We we went way over, but I think um, it was okay too in this instance because this is certainly very helpful. Um, if you don't mind, stop sharing, Rick. I'll take it over and share my screen real quick. Sure, absolutely. So let me see. Do I have to? Uh, do, 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 where are we? Stop share. There you go. You're Thank back. Thank you. I appreciate that. There's a lot of questions, Jess. And you feel free to pick whatever you would like. <laughs> uh -huh. um, all right, I just wanted to get this. Uh, uh, yeah, let's, I don't know, there's so many. Let's see. If you use risk control with risk reward of three to one, then you can lose more than you just, more than you win and still make money. Yeah, of course. Look, one of the best investors ever, George Soros, readily admitted in the 1990s, I think it was, that he generally only makes on about 35% of his trades, right? So he's only winning one of three times because, but when he wins, he wins so big, it offsets the two smaller losses. So that's understanding risk management. Keep your loss to small. Understand that this game is not set up for the individual to win so that you will have more losses than gains and readily accept that you're going to lose more often than you're going to win. It's not about how many times you lose versus how many times you win. It's how much you lose versus how much you win. So if you can make more money on a couple trades, I don't care if I lose five trades and win on two, right? If I put on seven trades, if I can keep my losses small on the five, I can still be ahead with winning on two because I win big. So understand that it's all about risk management. Put your ego away. It doesn't matter if you lose three times in a row. If you have a process you believe in, it should work over time. If you're consistently losing, then your process isn't a good process. But sometimes we all go through, you know, cold strings where we just aren't in sync with the market, whatever doing doesn't work. But if you can control your risk, then you can win at this game over time. And that's, that's what we try to do. Such a beautiful uh, quote, Rick. I wrote that down. If you're consistently <laughs> losing, then your process isn't a process. <laughs> I love that. Um, that is true, though, because I mean, if, if that's something that I've been taught my entire career is to take your emotions out of investing and always have a disciplined approach. But you really just took that to the next level, which is even if you have a disciplined approach, but you're losing more than you're winning, it's clearly not a process or the right approach, if you will. That was just so beautiful. Thank you for that. Oh, thanks. There's there's one here I want to address from uh, somebody named Ant A N H, uh, and it says preaching about Demark for us retail investors is not very feasible because of the cost and its complexity, and known for instability and reliabilities as to how it's interpreted from the original thoughts of Demark himself. 
Well, first of all, um, there's, there's several things I want to say about this. I'm not preaching that you get DeMarc software. In fact, I specifically said I would not. Um, but it's important for you to know that the calls that I make, I use his models as part of how I come up with the calls. So those will always be shown you in the plays or the research that we're giving you. So if I put out a daily play and there's a, you know, there's a reason I always explain why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I show you the chart annotated as the same way I've looked at it in order to come up with the play. So you see very well that I've, you know, I've explained why I'm putting on the trade. So I'm not saying that you should go out and get the software for yourself. I'm, I'm actually not encouraging that at all. I would discourage you from doing that. A, because it's expensive. B, the learning curve is very substantial. You are not, if you simply look at nines and thirteens, I promise you, you will get your rear end handed to you. It is not a simple model to understand and to master. It takes years. So I'm not suggesting you do that. I am saying to you as someone who for 27 or eight years or something like that, that I've been using these models and have mastered myself and and known in the demark world as the most successful person to consistently come up with winning trades from using his models that we use them here at options play in order to help come up with the ideas that we do so i'm not trying to have you get this stuff i don't think you should because it, it again it's expensive and it takes a long time to learn and master and understand when you take a signal from a 13 and when you wouldn't take it, even though it's staring at you in the face. Um, that just understand that it is part of my research process and why I come up with some of the buy and sell ideas I do. So I hope that addresses it. I'm not trying to tell you to buy a product and then tell you it's unstable and you shouldn't use it. I'm not telling you to buy it in the first place. I'm just telling you this is what's available in the institutional community, recently made more available to individuals. Again, there's a cost and you know there are certain software issues with it. So take that for what it is. Okay, Jess. Well said. Yeah, we're just giving you a peek behind the curtain. That's it. <laughs> Understanding <laughs> where they come from, <laughs> which, is, which is certainly helpful. Um, all right. Well, we hit 5:30, so we can we can close it there. I sincerely appreciate everyone for joining. If you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to info at optionsplay.com. In addition, if you're not an Options Play member and you want access to Rick's research or check us out, we do have a free 30-day trial. There's no cost to you for the first 30 days. So you can give us a, a, a quick look. You can attend our educational sessions, get access to those daily plays and some research. So feel free to give us a try. But thank you, everyone. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.